Hi, I'm Jonathan Gold. In photography, the most crucial factor in getting a technically good negative is proper exposure. And the first step in getting that proper exposure is choosing the right film for your purpose. Now, there are so many choices of films, as you've probably seen in the stores, and it's very confusing. Do you want films for prints, slides, black and white prints? Which film do you buy? Well, when we're talking about the question of exposure, the most important question to ask really is, what film speed? Which really takes us to the question of what kind of lighting conditions you think you're going to be shooting in. For example, do you expect to be at the beach that day? Do you expect to be at the theater that night? Do you expect to be in an area where there's maybe lots of different changing levels of light? Now, the film manufacturers have come up with a number rating system to help you figure out the different speeds of the film between high speed, medium, and slow speed film. And since the American Standards Association worked out this marvelous system, it's called, named after them, the ASA system. The low numbers in this number system refer to slow speed films. And those are the kind you'd basically use under conditions of very good light, fairly good light. And the higher numbers in this system refer to faster films, such as you would use under more difficult lighting conditions, not much light. Now, let's take a look at a sample box of film right here. This is Kodak Plus X film, and it says on it, film for black and white prints so that you can never make a mistake. And on the back side of the film, it has a little box that says ASA 125. Well, that's how you know how fast, or how slow for that matter, the film is. Now, for taking pictures under good light, the aforementioned beach, sunny, bright days, there are a whole lot of films you can choose. Slide films are the ones I want to show you the first. Look at these. Now, if you're going to the beach, you could take with you Ektachrome 64 ASA, and it says for color slides, so that you can never make a mistake. The number here refers to 64, in this case to its ASA, but it doesn't always on all boxes of film. Here's another one, Agfachrome 64, European. Both very, very fine films. If you wanted to shoot film to result in color prints, why, you could use color print film. such as these. Uh, Coda Color 2 is probably a long-time favorite in this country. It uh, produces, it has a 100 ASA, and it produces very, very fine color prints, but you could also use uh, Polaroid uh, pack color film for uh, prints, or for that matter, Kodak, if, in case you had the new Kodak instant camera. If you wanted to shoot black and white film under uh, conditions of relatively good light, a good choice would probably be and I have to find that. Kodak's Verachrome Pan. Kodak Verachrome Pan is a medium speed, a medium speed, not slow speed, black and white film. And another very good choice would be, especially if you have a 35 millimeter camera, this one is for simple cameras, another one would be the Plus X film that I just showed you, or Ilford FP4, a British film. Very, very good, medium speed, all purpose, general purpose, black and white film. Now, when these films are developed, what do you get? You get a negative, and that negative is then turned into a print. And in later shows, I'm going to show you how to develop your own negatives and how to print your own prints. It's very nice to do. For me, the real fun in photography is not really so much shooting under conditions of good light, but I like that too. It's shooting under conditions of poor light, bad light, uh, when there practically is no light. And that means also for me, taking pictures without a flash, because I feel that sometimes intrudes. And there are a whole range of other films which are really first rate for taking pictures under conditions of bad light, the so-called high-speed films. Now this would probably be a good time to stop for a second to tell you a little bit about what film actually is. Here's a piece of film, okay? It has two sides, but it also has a side here, a thickness. It's very, very thin, almost as thin as a sheet of paper, but believe it or not, this film is made in layers, and it's marvelous when you think about it, how great this stuff is. And I'm going to show you in a drawing what it would look like in a cross-section if you were to look at that edge of film in a microscope. Watch here. This circle I'm drawing, well, that's what you would see if you look through the lens of the microscope. And the first thing you would see, looking at the edge of the film, the thin edge, would be the base, like this. It's a transparent acetate film base, and by itself it's not sensitive, but the manufacturers mix 
silver nitrate with gelatin to make sensitive film. What is that? Microscopically sized silver nitrate crystals respond to light. They mix that with the gelatin and they paint that on the surface. They almost sort of roll it on like this. It's an emulsion, an emulsion it's called, and that sits on top of the base. That's what makes the film sensitive. The silver nitrate crystals sit in a suspension like that. Now, if they want to make color film, what they do is they pile on three emulsion layers, each sensitive to a different color. And then they develop them together, and they come up as a color negative or a slide. And I can tell you now how they make films more sensitive. In other words, how they make them faster. Simple. They simply enlarge the size of the silver nitrate crystals like this and pile them on there and those larger grained crystals respond to light more easily. Of course, faster film is a little more grainy as a result of that. That's okay. Nobody really seems to mind it because with these larger crystals you need very little light to impress an image on it. High speed film. Now the films that I mentioned before, those were slow speed films, the Kodachromes, the print films, and the ones that I'm about to talk about to you about now are the higher speed films, especially useful in low light. They're also called low light films by some photographers. Now the first group would be the color group. Here we are. If you want to shoot under conditions of uh, dark light, bad light with color slide film, a good choice would be Codex Ektachrome 200 and it says color film on it or film for color slides. This is for daylight conditions. If you want to shoot color slides under incandescent conditions, that means indoors, by ordinary house bulbs, a really great choice would be the new Kodak Ektachrome 160 tungsten. And it says tungsten on the side nearby where it says for color slides. That's how you know it's for tungsten light. Very, very good high-speed film for that. If you want to take pictures under bad light conditions and wind up with color prints, then the choice of film would be color print film, high speed. And in this case, it would be Kodak Kodacolor 400 ASA film or also, Fuji Color 400 ASA film, and it says on it also for color prints. The real kings of the available light or available darkness photography world would have to be the high speed black and white films. These are the films that you use for producing black and white prints. And here they are. Well, probably the time honored favorite has been Kodak Tri X Pan first-rate film. It is 400 ASA. Very, very fast. But there's also the equally good Ilford HP4. And that's the Ilford HP4 made in England, first-rate high-speed film too. If you have an instant camera such as a Polaroid camera, they make a film for their Polaroid pack cameras called 3000 speed. That number means that it is 3000 ASA. It is a very, very fast, extremely sensitive black and white print film. Now, there's a very logical number system, the ASA system, as I said, for discerning which of these films is which, at least in terms of speed. And here is a table I've drawn up called the ASA table. Now, the slower speed films were 25 ASA or 32 ASA. Medium speed films would be about 125 ASA. And the high speed films would be in the area of 400 or 800 ASA. That would be very fast. Now, you can use these numbers to help you figure out, for example, how much faster one film is than another. 200 ASA film would be half as sensitive as one that is 400 ASA. You could also say that the 400 ASA film is twice as sensitive, or you could say it was one stop faster, one whole stop faster. Now, in general, the slower the film, the speed of the film, the sharper and more crystal clear the final slides and prints are going to be. And the higher the f speed of the film, very often, the more grainy and perhaps less sharp the prints are going to be. But at the same time, there's an advantage. Besides the fact you can shoot under bad light, the high-speed films have lots of latitude, and they allow for freezing action in high-speed sports photography, for example. Now, let me give you some good tips, general tips, on the proper use of these films. I would suggest that you process them as quickly as possible after you make your pictures. Secondly, when you get the film, check the expiration date, which is always written on the side of the box. In this case, it says for the Ilford film, October 1980. Don't use it beyond that date. And really, another tip, refrigerate the film if you're not going to use it right away, and then allow it to defrost for a couple of hours before you do using it. Do use it. The refrigerated film will last much, much longer. 
Now, once you have your film, the next stage, of course, is to load your camera. This is how we do it. In this particular camera, open up the back, and I'm going to show you what's going to happen to the film when I put it in. I'm going to put it in this section here. It's going to be drawn across the shutter, go across these sprocket gears, and be wound up on this spool. Now let's do it. Open up a box of Coda Color 400, high speed color print film. Don't throw away the instruction sheet. Very useful, and I'll tell you why shortly. Now what happens? I pull it across the shutter, load it in here, take up the slack, and then make sure with your finger that the sprocket holes in the film are, are held tightly by the sprocket gear, like this. Then close it up, close it down, and you're almost ready to shoot. Now your next stage slight problem here. Your next stage, of course, would be to set the ASA of the camera. What is that? Well, this camera has a meter and it has an ASA window, and if you don't set the meter for the ASA of the film, it won't know what film you're using. Now, here it is, right there. It is now set at 100 ASA, and I want to set it to 400 ASA, so I lift it up, move it to 200, to 400. We're just about ready to take pictures. But this brings us to the problem of proper exposure. Proper exposure. How do you set your camera to get the best exposures on the film? After all, the light levels are constantly changing. You're going indoors, you're darting, darting outdoors. How do you do it? Light, well, that's the essential component of any photograph, of course. It can come from the sun or through clouds or from light bulbs or off from a stage and theater. It has to be there, even if it's just from candles. It has to be there. And it's the light that's reflected off of your subject, really, which is what counts as far as the film is concerned. Now, you've set the ASA control. The controls in the camera that help you determine the proper exposure for the film are the aperture control on the lens and the shutter control. They make it possible, when intelligently used together, to record a picture on that film which is exactly right, which is neither too dark nor too light. In other words, properly exposed. Now, good exposure, as I said, is the single most important factor in getting a technically good print or a slide. Most people, well, most photographers, usually use an exposure meter to help set the aperture and the shutter, you know, to, so that they can set the camera for the level of light. But if you don't happen to have a light meter either in the camera or a regular hand meter, don't worry. The instructions with the film are what can save you. Now, look here. Here's the instruction sheet for the Coda Color 400. On the top part, it gives you a range of settings for average daylight conditions down through fairly cloudy days. Most films can handle that. This particular instruction sheet also provides you with a series of recommended exposures for available light situations, such as if you wanted to take pictures at a circus or indoors or out on the street at night. And it recommends all sorts of useful speeds for that and settings. So don't throw away the instructions. Very, very useful. Now, if light meters come in two distinct types, in the camera and out of the camera. The in the camera meters, well, they're very, very convenient, of course. They're right there with you all the time. Um, they're very, very popular. They're built into many cameras today, but they are not foolproof. In fact, sometimes they can be downright quirky. And you often find that meters from different manufactured cameras don't often agree with each other. Really get to know that meter. Now, how do you use these things? Basically, you bring the camera up to your eye, and you look at your subject, and as you set the aperture and the shutter controls, it moves a little needle inside to indicate the proper exposure. Let me show you what that looks like with the model we've rigged up. Here I am in a 35 millimeter single lens reflex camera. And this little needle here is what you have to look at and via the use of the controls, center. When it's centered, presumably, done everything else right, you will get the right exposure of that particular subject. Now, if you happen to be in doubt, if you're not quite sure that you have set the right exposure, after all your best efforts, 
do it, many professionals do. They take other exposures, different exposures of the same subject, one stop up, one stop down, plus the normal. That will guarantee them something, but I would have to hasten to say that you can't always trust that. What you really want to do is learn your meter as well as possible. Not all subjects are going to stick around while you patiently go from one f-stop to another. Now, handheld meters, such as this, they've been around for 40 or 50 years. They're much more sensitive than in-camera meters, they're more versatile, and they can be used with much more precision, but they are, of course, less convenient. Now, there are several different types of handheld meters which are made. Uh, we're just going to talk about the reflected type today, and within that group, there are, again, two different types, those that are driven with a battery and those that are not. This one is a battery-driven meter, a cadmium sulfide cell meter. The battery goes in the back here, and when you use this meter, you aim, I'll open this up, you aim the light-sensitive cell directly at your subject and take your reading. Now, you can also get a meter that is not battery-driven, which has a selenium cell as the light-sensitive element. They tend to be a little less expensive, less sensitive, but still very accurate if the light is good enough. Now, the part's the meter. This is the part where the light goes into the meter and activates it. You aim that at your subject, and in this case, when I press this button, bang, the needle suddenly moves like that. At this point, I bring the red pointer to the black line, and then I can read off the exposures. I have to make sure, of course, that I've set the ASA properly. It gives you a range of, gives you a range of exposures in both f-stops and shutter speeds, which you would set. Now, let's see. Here is f11 at a 250th of a second if I were going to shoot a picture of the ceiling of the studio. And I'm going to set that on a twin lens reflex camera such as this. Now, let's see. What did that say again? A 250th of a second at f11. Okay. A uh, 200, let me see, first we'll go to F11 like that on the aperture scale, and then a 250th of a second. When I take a picture at that setting, I will get, hopefully, what will be a perfect negative. What constitutes a perfect negative, a good negative? Well, that would really be a negative that had registered upon it, on its surface, all of the major tones of the original scene, but in tones of gray, or as we would say, zones of gray such as in this print over here. Here's a print of a lady photographed by window light, and it has all the major tones represented in it from the original scene, of course. Her hair is black. Her uh, collar looks white. Actually, it was light yellow, but it translates into almost white in this print. Uh, the wall is a medium gray. Her sweater is a darker gray, so on down the line. If it were a black face that she had, then that face would be a sort of a middle gray. But in any case, it would be gray. It's a good idea, I think, to start learning to see in terms of gray tones, such as the prince is going to see it or the film is going to see it. Now, the meter, when I made this scene, the meter took in all of these tones into an average of a gray, a middle gray. The meter is an averaging meter. They call it averaging meter. And this is where, for many people, the real problems in exposure begin. Why is that? Most light meters today are made to get the most accurate reading if you take your readings reflected from an 18% gray card. This is a photographic tool, a manufactured item, a gray, uh, called a gray card. The meters are made to assume that all of the tones in this particular picture are going to average out to the same gray that's in this card. Well, that's all well and fine if you're shooting scenes which do have quite a normal even spread of tones like this. But if you're faced with a scene which is either much lighter or much darker than normal, and you still want to preserve that lightness or darkness, you have to reinterpret the meter reading because the meter is going to be fooled. The meter thinks that everything averages out to a middle gray and that that's how you want it. You may not. Come with me to the studio. I've set up here a scene which sort of has most of the tones a real-life scene might have. That is, it has a bunch of light tones, dark tones, middle tones. It's what you would call the famous average scene. Now, I'm going to take a picture of it, but first I'm going to take a reading of it. And I'll do it from back here. And I get a suggested exposure of F16 at an eighth of a second. Fine. Let's take the picture. I'm going to put this picture onto Polaroid film so that we can see it right away. Cock the shutter, 
and make the exposure. Okay. Now I'll develop the film. Now if I've done everything right, I should be able to get a good picture, right? Well, let's see. There we go. That's pretty good. I like that. All the tones are pretty much as they were in the original picture, in the original scene. Uh, the camera's sort of middle dark gray, and the face is light, and the background is a middle gray. Now what happens if I suddenly decide to fool the meter? Well, watch this. The meter took its reading based on the fact that the background wasn't too much different from the subject. That's fine. Now I'm suddenly faced with a much darker background, but you'll notice that the light hasn't changed on my subject at all. Now I take a reading. Now I take a reading of the subject, and let's see what happens. Well, boy, it goes down just about a couple of stops. And I now have to set it, instead of an eighth of a second, I have to set it at a half a second at F16, just because of the background. Well, let's see what happens. Cock it. Aperture is still set. Pull it out. Take the picture. And develop it. Now you can expect a change, right? You're going to see one. Okay. Just as I expected, just as I predicted. The bust is too light. The camera is lighter than it should be. And you'll notice that the background in both of these are almost exactly the same tone. And yet this one is black and the other one was a middle tone. The meter sees everything as a middle gray. Now I'm going to show you a system to get away from being hassled by that problem, and it's this. Use the palm of your hand as an impromptu gray card and measure off that. The palm of the hand is one stop lighter, but all you do is use a reading one stop more open than the exposure you get from it. And you do it like this. You go up to the subject, put the hand there, and being very careful, being very careful not to cast a shadow on it, you get a reading and you open it up one stop. Now the reading I got was an uh, fifteenth of a second at sixteen, and I would open it up to an eighth of a second at sixteen, which is exactly the exposure I got before. Now let's take the picture. Isn't this fun? Wait 15 seconds. And open it up. And show you the picture. Well, it's a trifle darker. It developed at a different time. But it's about this, it's close enough. In any case, I got a good exposure of the face. I can still see the camera. Well, in fact, the faces are exactly the same tone now. Only the background is black again, as it should be. Now, supposing I add suddenly another light. Very many lighting situations involve cross-lighting like this. Well, you can't use the same exposure as before because what's going to happen is the white side of the face is going to be overexposed. What do I do? I take two readings off the palm of my hand, like this. One towards the light, and I notice what that is. Well, that's a lot brighter. Let's see, that's um, 16 at a 60th. Wow. And then off the shadow side, being careful to shield the cell of the meter so that uh, no extraneous light gets in. And that's three stops down from that. And what I want to do is put it in between those two settings, and then again, because it's the palm, open up one stop, and then make the setting. Well, in this case, I get an exposure of a fifteenth of a second at sixteen. Fifteenth of a second. So I set it. Okay. And here we go. Put in a piece of film. And I should get a picture which has on it a nice light side of the face, but not overexposed, a dark side of the face, not too dark, and the camera still visible, and all the other tones looking relatively good. Well. Give it another few seconds and let's see what we get.
Aha. Fine. Camera's a little darker. Sure. But now both the bright and the shadow side of the face are perfectly recorded on the film. Couldn't be better. Come on over here with me to the gallery now. The first print is of a gentleman farmer in Italy. And for this, making the exposure of this, why, an average reading is fine because all of the tones in it are already sort of a middle gray. Um, the face is a light gray, the, the uh, shirt is a middle gray. An average reading would get you the correct exposure. You'd be on. That's fine for that, but supposing you come across a situation like this. This is a landscape in California, Point Lobos. And here, the light sky is going to give you an overinflated reading if you include too much of the sky in the reading. So my suggestion would be, which would result, by the way, in an underexposed landscape, is aim the meter down towards the ground somewhat and then note that reading and then raise the camera to your eye and no, regardless of how the needle changes again, shoot the picture at the ground level exposure, okay? The photograph on the bottom is an old mansion in Nashville, Tennessee, and here it's an average scene too in a way. That is, all the tones are pretty close together, but if this negative had been over or underexposed by too much, I would not have been able to record all of the delicate grays and tones which are inherent in this particular photograph. Exposure is important. Here is a study in contrasts. The picture on the right is really a simple picture. It's just a, a white piece of paper behind some people dressed in sheets shot by window light. If I had used the reading off from the camera position that was indicated, I would have gotten gray sheets and not white ones. I went up to the face, took the reading off of my hand, and then opened up one stop and used that setting on the camera, and that got a right exposure. The picture by George Krauss on the left of a young black child is actually a a study in light. Light is used in the design and in a sense probably the meter was partially ignored in order to achieve this effect. In other words, by not making the middle of the face too light, a normal skin tone for a black person, underexposed it deliberately and then accented thereby the side lights on the face so it produces this very beautiful kind of an effect. Okay, I've shown you something about exposure. Go out, get yourself a camera, get yourself an exposure meter, note the ASAs and have fun with photography, keep shooting, and I'll see you again next time. <laughs>